Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show today. Hey, man, if this is the first time you're showing up, welcome. Glad you found it. And I got to tell you, man, you know what? I've been working at this pretty hard. And uh, you know when you do hard work and it pays off and you feel great? I'm feeling that. You know why? For the last week or two, I've been on, the show's been on, the What's Hot section in iTunes. And this is something I've, I've worked on for a year, you know? So thanks to you guys, we're on the What's Hot section. I'm sitting right by Tim Ferriss. That feels pretty good. Now listen, today's episode, we're going to get into it. Today's super agent uh, so uh, is Diane Williams. Now, this lady, this girl... Um, used to be in open heart surgery so she and then she went into the newspaper business so she's used to like deadlines she's used to like super frenetic you know uh situations and for her when she migrated into real estate she felt like she kind of got that same bit right this this 24 7 uh uh you know high pressure uh cooker uh kind of environment so here's what we talk about today um, now, again, for her, she operates well in constantly evolving industries and, and high pressure. She is in the Coachella Valley. She's in the luxury market. And what we talk about is how to break into, for her, uh, ultra luxury or the country club market, the golf course communities. Um, and uh, we talk about how she digs into the data to figure out where there's opportunity. And I think, I think if you uh, listen to this, I think uh, using that kind of data even for yourself uh, will make sense. And that's why I'm hearing this. Um, and, and look, really, if you like the kind of tips and tricks that uh, we uncover in this episode, you're going to want to do two things. Number one, go to our site, superagentslive.com. Number one, download my book. I have a book that I wrote, 52 page book called how to sell, uh, and, uh, that get on my list. And number two, uh, join our membership. Now we have a free level of membership and there's going to be a paid one. It's not even up yet. Uh, but the free one, man, I have, uh, I have spreadsheets. I have uh, budgeting spreadsheets. I have lead tracker spreadsheets. I have a lot of good stuff, um, for free. And then we're going to get into some stuff that, you're gonna, that if you want, you, you can pay for it. It's going to be, there's going to silver, gold, whatever. <clears throat> um, and, uh, as you know, we're doing radio. So this episode is brought to you by me. By our radio arm. Now, uh, we have clients who are out there, and I, I, I want to come up with a name. Um, and uh, I'm going to throw a name out to you guys. And I would love an email let, letting me know if you hate it, if you like it. I ran it by, I ran it by somebody I, um, I, I respect today. And he's like, Toby, I got to swallow hard at that one. Um, but again, I, you know, I see uh, you know, for what we're building, we're going to have 100 top producers, like top, top, top people in our group. And so here's, here's the name. I bought this domain name, and uh, I was going to start calling the radio arm this. You ready for it? It's going to be the Cartel Media Group. Now, if you get any negative associations from that word cartel, um, if you look up the definition, it's only a group of people conspiring not to let other people into the market or to keep prices high. Now, I see, again, our radio arm. That's what we're doing. When Our radio folks are going to dominate their market. So, again, the cartel media group, um, we're going to prevent other people from coming in and, uh, in, and, and really doing well in the market. So uh, let me know what you think. Uh, just go to my website or the website, superagentslive.com, and send me an email. All right. Hey, let's get to the show. Welcome to Super Agents Live. This is the one place where you can come and hear the most successful people in real estate. You'll hear how these super agents have built their businesses, how they stay productive, and how they stay motivated. Who am I? My name's Toby Salgado, and I made my first million in real estate. Yeah. And I'm your host for the next 30 minutes while we talk to yet another amazing real estate yeah. entrepreneur. Stay tuned. Let's go. Today's guest is going to be pretty fun. Before getting into real estate, she worked in open heart surgery under life and death situations. Then she went to the newspaper industry where deadlines are always looming. We're going to see today how her get it done attitude benefits her in real estate and how she makes it work. I'm thrilled to welcome my guest, Diane Williams. Hey, Diane, thanks for taking the time out today. Oh, thanks for giving me a call and inviting me. Yeah, no problem. So listen, you do have a, a pretty varied background. So maybe take a minute, tell us a little bit about yourself and then and then tell me what you're you know, tell me about your business that you have right now. Well, it's interesting. Obviously you introduced the fact that working in open heart surgery, um while I was doing that, I was also doing um research. Um and at twenty five years old 
I was invited to meet with the board of directors for Baxter Travenal in Chicago to tell them what was going on with their their um, their oxygenation equipment. And from there, I went down to William Harvey in Long Beach. I was a very young kid. And here I am t- meeting with boards of directors for the research that we did. So even though I was working in open heart surgery, what you know, my whole motivation was what we what can we do to make the, the patient respond better. Hmm. So when I left that industry, I went into and I went back to college, got my business degree, and while I was doing that, I got into the newspaper industry, which is deadlines. But again, I go back in, and what m- motivates me is. What is going on? What are we missing? And what do we need to create in order to do better? So I'm a person that's in constant change. I, I'm, I'm looking at things that need to be improved upon all the time. So when I get done with that, then I got into um, the, the real estate, and it was just it was just a shoe in. I'm used to working 24/7. That's how my brain works. I go to a movie for two hours. I've had a half day off, and I feel fine. So I'm used to working under pressure, but nothing is ever constant. So with the real estate, with the people that you work with, every contract that you ever do or anything, you're constantly learning something that you can apply. So that just it was just kind of a shoe-in for me to be in real estate just because of being able to be very creative with contracts because I'm used to constant change. Well, so, so you, I mean, if, if I look at what you did, uh, you know, a, around the medical industry and then, and then what you did in the newspaper industry, I mean, you have this sort of analytical mind, right? So that yeah, kind of yeah. what, but so how do you, I, I mean, I want to understand how that, that, that the analytics and the, you know, what you look at and how that helps you today. And also, but how does that, you know, how does that tie into the fact that, you know, you love being creative, right? Because right, creatives typically aren't, right, analytical like, like you. So, but again, let's yeah. take into the analytics and, 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 you know, how that benefits you in, in the real estate business. Well, in the beginning when I started the business, and I've been in the business 11 years, mm-hmm. when I first started off, um, you know, my first thing was, what did I not know or what did people not tell me? What did I not, as a, as a, as a, a um, person wanting to sell my home, what, what information did I want to have that I was never given? So I started doing the research. I started and, and for two reasons. One, to give people um, a way of learning about what's going on in the real estate market, but also something that would keep me current always keep me in current knowing exactly what's going on with the market. So I started doing these reports, just starting doing history and giving reports. And I think the third quarter, I thought, eh, nobody really cares. And I started getting phone calls saying, where's your report? You're late. And I realized that evidently I was satisfying a need for a, lot, a number of people, and so I continued to do them. And with each report that I do, I get better and better. And then it ta- and it kind of takes a you know, um, energy onto itself. And so, like, if you were to go back and look at my very first quarterly pa- report back in 2004, it was, you know, to right now makes my stomach turn. But it was the beginning of a progression of, of becoming better and better and more knowledgeable about the industry. You know, what's happening locally, what's happening, because my feeling is that in order for me to do the very best job I can for my clients, I have to know what's going on in the market. Because we're, we're talking about spending, um, costing people a lot of their investment money if we don't know what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, I'll tell you. So, so you got into business in two thousand four, um, and that was it was a very good time to be in real estate back then. And I'll, and I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you a personal story. So, I the place where I live today, I bought in, in two thousand four. <clears throat> And I, my first house, this is my second house. Uh, my first house, I paid, I'm in San Diego, I paid 225000 bucks or something like that. And it was a little, this old 1946, you know, three bedroom, one bath thing. Um, and that's where, like, I got married, bought the house. Anyhow, so I went from the $200,000 house, and my next house was a million bucks. I paid a million bucks for this thing. Now, that was a big jump for me. And I was like, geez, man, you know. And, and I put, you know, I, I did traditional, so I put 200 grand down, the whole 20%. And I was, I was a little bit nervous about it. So I did, I wanted to, you know, uh, me being sort of an analytical guy as well, I dug in and said, man, h- how can I lose on this, right? Like what? So I looked at the market, looked at the market. And historically at that time, I, I found one place in Texas where, you know, the environment, the market crashed like 20%. So I was like, okay, if that's all I can find in the last like 40 or 50 years in terms of a drop, 
I should be okay. I'm not going to to lose my shirt, uh, you know, on 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 this house. L- little did I know, right? 2008 happens, and that 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 breaks all new records. Um, right. When you were doing this the, these quarterly reports, like, I mean, tell me, just give me an overview. What are, are you like? I'm not sure. What were you? What are you pulling out? What are you trying to to what picture are you trying to paint? Okay, uh, initially what I'm, you know, it's it's basically I take 20, you know, because I do a lot of country club. I do more of the luxury. Um, I do everything in the Coachella Valley. But basically, if you're going to compare the country clubs that are, that are golf course communities, because that was the biggest draw that comes into the Palm Springs, Palm Desert area. And so I started to watch what they were doing, what's happening to their prices. Are they going up and going down? And I would do it by quarterly. And, and, and you know, you could see this expansion, 2005, 6, and 7. It was just going crazy. And, and the, you know, the percent affordability for um, first-time buyers went down anywhere down to 11 to 15%. So we really didn't there, – there was no affordability for the people that were actually working within the community and living year-round. They couldn't afford to buy a property. And so, you know, everything that was going crazy. So by April of 2007, I had all me, all these investors coming in, and they wanted to buy, and they wanted to jump on. And my first question I asked them was, do you have the funds to continue to make the loan payments if you have no one that comes in to rent the property in this market fluctuate, you know, tanks because I said everything is cyclical and I think we're at the you know, we're about ready to to tumble, and they would say no, and then I would encourage them not to buy and hmm. to sit this market out, and I was I was dead on, and so there were you know because obviously what happened after that is so many of the people who had gotten in late to the game. You know, it's like the people that, you know, they're, they're leaders and then they're followers, where there's a lot of followers that buy late in the game, and they're the ones that get burned. Yeah. Okay, so, and so in 2007, I said, we're going to be having a change here unless you can afford to hold the property and continue to make payments without any income coming back your way for that property. Sit it out. And, um, and I was dead on. Okay, well, now we're sitting here in a totally different thing. We collapsed from the bottom. Mm-hmm. And we're healing from the bottom. So now this year, starting the middle of May, of middle of March, we started selling more of the million dollar properties here. And I go, just watch. The papers are going to sit there and they're going to tell them how much we have appreciated and how much the homes have gone up in value. And you know, and and numbers wise, when you clump them all together, it looks good. But but it's not true. So what I do is I break it down to specific areas, specific communities, um, and I, I really break it down so that just because um, Palm, you know, Palm Desert looks like it's up 20%, it is really not true, and the numbers get skewed. So my part of my quarterly report is to make sense of the of the information so that the person who's actually thinking about putting their home doesn't have unrealistic expectations. Got it. So, so, and I can see how I can, you know, so you work with uh, mainly investors. So I can see how you, you know, you being a reliable source of information helps your career. I mean, if, if I look back when you said, Hey man, I don't know if you should, you know, buy something right now. I mean, you're, you're, you're helping them, but hurting you on speculation that, that uh, we're, we were at that time moving into a, not a great environment. What do you see today? I mean, so do you only track luxury homes in your area or do you, do you look at national trends? I, tr- I I do some national, um, you know, in, in a general sense, but I do more of the local um, because of the, because of the resort environment. Who's coming? So how I will look at it from it's like okay, the baby boomers are coming, but you know the the Y generation, you know, what are they doing? Right. What are their trends? What are they looking for to buy? And of course, it's like the baby boomers are downsizing. Their kids, on the other hand, are the ones that are venturing out and buying more expensive homes. And so knowing who the market is and what they're going to be looking for is very, very helpful because then it ha- in, in knowing that, it helps me also then when I'm looking for a property, you know, when I'm looking to do my quarterly reports, what information then will be important to them to make their decision to come here to the desert as opposed to going to Florida or Arizona mm-hmm. or wherever else their options are. So, so you bring up an interesting point, right? So you are in Coachella Valley, which, you know, you're in California, um, sort of inland California now, uh, su- inland Southern California. Um, 
How so? If you have you have an outside investor right out of the state, and they're choosing, okay, I'm going to go to Coachella, I'm going to go to Florida. You know, they have the choice of of where to go. How are you reaching out? Um, and you know, in terms of capturing those leads, in terms of capturing those people, and uh, you know, getting them on your list to even get them this information, because again, that's something I think people want to know. Like, hey, how does how does Diane go out and and you know, spread her net, you know, from California all the way to Georgia, for example? Well, there's you know, because of the of the, the media background that I've had, you know, I still believe in 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 print media. There's a number of, of agents who only go web, internet web, and, and for me, um, you know, I know that there's 93% of the people start looking on the internet. So I created a website that's easy to use, does not require anybody to register, and they can use it as often as they want. And so and that's got many, many needles. I mean, it just goes out and spreads everywhere. Um, so I'm capturing a lot of people that are doing the search, you know, the search engines and whatever, and I've been able to do a pretty good job on that. But I still, 45% of the people are still doing print media research when they're looking for a home. So I'm making sure that I'm reaching out. So like, for example, October issue of Palm Springs Life is being sent to Canada. Okay, and, and we have a large group of Canadians that are coming to the Palm Springs area. So I'm going in, I'm doing a two-page spread, attracting that person or those people up in Canada to come down to the desert. And then it always links it to my website. Right, so... <clears throat> Okay, on your website. So here's here's you know as internet marketers. I mean, this is if you even go to my website, you know, I I there's uh, it's called a bribe kind of right. I, you know, you give me your email address and I'll give you something right. I don't make you register, but you know, in, in I wrote a little uh, 32 page ebook called How to Sell. It's, it's pretty good. It's worth you giving me your email address, but you know that's a that's an email capture form. That's one thing that I think a lot of agents in terms of, of, of capturing the traffic that they get, because you work hard to get internet traffic. And when you get them, you know, you don't want them to pop on and bounce off. So I'm curious to know, you know, you don't make them register, but h- how do you, how do you, um, cause I might go on your site, Diane, I might go, Oh, this is pretty cool. I'm going to get another phone call. I click off your site and I, I'm, and even if I want to go back, I'm not going to remember where I was. What kind of things do you do once you get that traffic that you that you convert it at least to get their email or phone number or something? Right. Then there's always the contact back to them. But then in addition to that, what I was given the opportunity I think three years ago, anyone who comes in is on Facebook doing anything, and then for whatever reason clicks on Riverside County and starts looking for homes. I am the only agent who has any kind of a, um, a, a, a any. I have six ads that will pop up at any point in time, and the only one there. So I capture anybody that does that. So it's drawing to them. Most of the time, I find that you know the, the just because you know they are they're looking on a website doesn't mean they're going to capture you and they're going to come and they're just going to use you. So mm-hmm. you know my whole the whole thing that my whole purpose the whole thing that drives my business is my referral business and and the, you know and I, I I work with a lot of people who are professional people other agents love to refer me they like to work with me because I'm just common sense so most of my business that I get is from referral business and that's that makes my life very easy because it's all based on my reputation so it is you know it's like we can we can chase the people on the website they have no idea who I am compared to anyone else until they actually sit down and start talking to me on the phone. Other than that, I'm just another name and, you know, another person who does the business. And so it's harder to convert them to fall in love with me and want to use me. It's much easier to have someone who's been referred to me um, by other people. Um, and it's so much easier to capture, capture their business. So for me, time and energy is that it takes less time for me to, um, to to attract buyers when they have been referred to me by my uh, former clients, past clients. Well, yeah, of course. I mean, I mean, that's. I mean, everybody, you know, everybody wants to have a referral business. You just sit back and wait for the phone to ring. But, but you know, you're you're doing more than that, right? So you you are doing some. It sounds like you're doing some Facebook ads, which is which is pretty cool. Um, and you're doing this this print media stuff. So what again? I'm I'm trying to understand because look, you have this niche, right? You're in Riverside, which is overall not a great. If people think if people in California know Riverside, like that is 
kind of like Fresno. It's not a great place to be. I mean, but you except yeah, except that the problem with that is that the Palm Springs area is linked to Riverside, ah, so that right. it, it gets a bad picture when in fact it's a rather exclusive community. Anyway. Right, right. And I'm I, and I'm not saying anything negative. I'm just saying what I'm what we, here's the picture I'm trying to 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 draw out is. Um, so overall, Riverside not attractive, but your niche is you have this high end niche in in you know Riverside as a whole is a is a low low end area. Other than I know Palm Springs is 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 relatively exclusive. So um, why did you pick? Uh, uh, I mean, I guess you got you have two niches, right? You said okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna lay my roots down in Palm Springs, number one, and then two, I'm just gonna focus on high end you know luxury vacation homes. I don't know, maybe so. Give us your thoughts around why you picked that niche and why you think that's a great place for you to be. Well, it's interesting. I don't know that I ever picked a niche. Mm. Um, and, and I think you know, anybody that goes into the real estate business, it's sort of what you, you know, what is it that you first get? And my very, very first listing was a home that probably had, you know, I don't know if you've ever saw it, was, I think it was American. Um, whatever, with Annette Benning, and she was standing out in this yard with this pool that looked just terrible. And she said, I am going to sell this house. Well, that was equivalent to my very first listing. An attorney gave me a referral for my very first listing. And the and what I learned from that, and I'm going, am I going to be selling $200,000 homes or am I going to be selling a million? I don't think anybody that knows actually knows where their business is going to go. But what I did do for the first five years, I was I enrolled with um, Mike Ferry. Mm. And, okay, and Mike Ferry then was where you actually, they taught you how to do the business plan. They told you what you needed to do if you wanted to make a certain amount of money, what you needed to do and how many calls you needed to make, and, and you did that. And and so, you know, in the, in the beginning, you, you really, really pushed to get out there and get your name out there and whatever. And so the, for those five years, I knew what I needed to do as a rookie agent who doesn't have some sort of a real estate coach. They make it much harder on themselves because – it's sort of, you know, with your blinders on, not knowing where to go and not knowing how to start. Yeah. And well, I mean, Mike Ferry is this old school. I mean, and look, Mike has been on the show and, you know, but but, uh, you know, Mike Ferry is very much very old school, just straight prospecting and follow up guy. Um, and it's and it, and it is really sort of the kind of stuff that he talks about is pretty elementary. And it's and it's like yeah. not the, I mean, I, I want to get your take on this because I just had one of his his coaches on. and It was a pretty good episode. But but, man, it was just dry and like it was all scripted. And I was like, I, it just didn't feel I natural never- to me. Yeah, well, see, and the interesting thing is I, what I gained from them was the, the, the business plan, mm. creating what I thought was the business plan. I never did the scripts because um, you have to be authentic. You know, you have to say it in the words that work for you. And if it does, if, if for whatever reason I'm not convincing that client the way I'm speaking, if I'm not convincing them, then when I go back, I say, what is it that I could have said differently? Mm. How could I have done differently? And so every single transaction I do in the conversation, I go back and I do a reevaluation saying, what can I learn from, from this so that I can apply it to, the, to, the, um, to my future business? So I'm in a constantly growing thing. The thing that I, I gave them up in 2009 for two reasons. They had this um, like triangular thing of 28 things that you're supposed to be doing. I was doing five of them, and I was at the top of the industry. By my second year in the business, I was number one with Windermere, the top company here, and I, and I remain so. What drives me is I love to win. Mm. And, okay, I love to to win and it's not beating the other person i don't look at the other agents as my competition i look at them as my peers and i treat with them with the utmost respect because if you you can't act alone in this business because if you do they can kill you if you're not you know if you don't know how to, if you don't know how to behave yourself you don't know how to negotiate and you can't negotiate with a smile on your face it's going to be really hard to get other agents to show your property and you'll never be successful the other part of the thing that i felt was and my question was I'm not interested in doing numbers of sales. I am interested in providing a service to my client so that client wants to come back to me, refer me, and, and talks about me because that is worth more than anything I can ever, you know, I, the, you can't put a dollar amount on that. And so through the quarterly reports, 
those reports carry me so far that I get every every quarter I get someone saying, I don't know how I got on your mailing list, but I am so glad I did. I'm not thinking of selling right now, but when I do, you're my person. Or I get calls where people are going to be listing. That is probably my marketing report is probably the single most valuable thing that I have to promote my business because people forward it, they do it, they you know, whatever. And that is always on my website for people to see. Okay, so there's there's a few things I want to talk about. I'm, I'm writing this down. So I want to talk about I want to talk about your report and how other people can do that, even if they're not. Um, I also want to talk. You said this, you know, coopetition working with other agents. But here's what I want to ask you about. So you said that every conversation you have, you go back and for yourself, you kind of do an autopsy on it, right? So you kind of break it down right. and go a, po- a post mortem, right? In your in your medical experience, right? Medical background right. language. <clears throat> okay, so you do this post mortem. And you think about what you can do better. And I want to hear. I want to ask you something. I had this conversation last night with a very, very, very big name in real estate. And we're this is a this guy is a very big name, and we're starting to become friends. And and uh, you know, we spent two hours last week on the phone. We had a conversation last night, and he was saying, "Hey, Toby, you know what? I I want to I want to work with you, and and all this stuff, right?" And he said, "You know what?" And he said, "And and I'm I'm all on board because so far you haven't screwed me over." And, and like, we're having this light kind of like really open conversation and just like for, you know, I was trying to be light and here's what I said. I said, he said, you haven't screwed me over. And I, and I said, yet now I totally meant that to be a joke. And he's like, hold on, man, take that back. And I said, I said, dude, I'm, I was like, that was a, like a, a joke, man. I mean, I mean, if I, you know, and I didn't, uh, you know, and I woke up this morning, I felt bad about it. You know, I mean, I, 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 I I mean, how, again, I'm sure that has happened to you or a version of that where somebody took something the wrong way. How can you, like, what do you do? What should I do? I mean, should I go back and should I address it again? Or should I, like, just act like it never happened? Or I'm sure this is, you know, so tell me your thoughts on that. Well, because usually one of the things is that when I go back, is like we know that there's four different personality types. And I know that as an analytical, you give me a, um, you give me an engineer, you give me an accountant, or you give anyone, you know, any of those professional people. I'm going to work with those people like nobody's business, and it's going to go very quickly because mm. I know numbers, and so so do they. Okay, so then from the other side is there's another personality that let's say is more of an emotional one, can't make their decision, mm. they can't make up their mind. Okay, I know that my personality is such that I have to work a little bit. Harder harder on that person to be able to connect with that person and there are times when I'll make a comment that I think is a funny joke Mm -hmm. and they and and they don't and you know and it's the question is whether I you know I ask my question okay what could I have said differently um how you know in the next time that that should come up um, you just don't bother to say it again. I, I remember that this person is this kind of personality, so therefore that is something that I have to be very careful about saying. Probably the first thing I would do is I would probably pick up the phone and call them and say, I think I might have said something that offended you. I want you to know that um, I thought about this, and, and here's where my thought process was, and I just wanted to make sure that we cleared the air. Mm. Now the question is whether or not I get that person back or not. Is, is really not important if I've you know if I've messed it up or if that person has misread me or we don't relate then you have to kind of just let it go and move on to the next but learn from that and so it's like not beating myself up um, for you know because we're only human right so but, it, but it's learning from it um, I had a session last week I have weekly meetings with the people that are on my team now and it's like who are you what is your personality and then here are the four personalities. And so what I'm going to be doing each week is we're going to be taking clients that we have, and I'm going to say, ask questions about how would you work with each of these clients and how would you approach them and what would you say to them because that's the learning process that I think is so important is learning to be able to communicate. You know, the old mirror and match type thing? Mm-hmm. Well. You still do some of that, but you still have to be genuine. Yeah. Okay. They, they have to see it. And I think what I've been able to balance um, through all of this is that whatever people see, they whether they agree with me or not, they know that I'm real and they know that I'm genuine. 
you know, they know that I have, you know, my first goal is I have a fiduciary responsibility to my clients to give them fair market value for their home so they can make a decision as to whether or not they want to sell their home or wait. And so my goal is not to go in there and get their listing. That's not my goal. My goal is good to go in there with my expertise to give them the information that I think is important for them to make the decision. And when they make that decision that's right for them, then I'm hoping that they, I'll be the one that they pick. And most of the time, a large percentage of the time, I am that person because I'm str- I'm, I dare to not lie to them Yeah. to make them feel good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... Okay, that was good. I mean, that was a good answer. I just, I think, I think when, I think what, you, you hit on the, in, in terms of trying to address my question to you, uh, you know, there, you can be all business, right? I can be all business and I will never offend you because I'm all business. But, but what you're going to not get when I'm all business is you're not going to get me, right? I'm not being fully, you know, I'm certainly being authentic as a business person, but I'm, but I'm not letting my personality out. And I think, you know, especially with this show, you know, I've learned to let my hair down a little bit and, uh, and it pays off. I just like, sometimes things go wrong. Just like I said, that comment, I, I, you know, I clearly meant nothing by it. You know, we were at the beginning of a business, you know, the kind of partnership we're working together anyhow. Okay. Well, <clears throat> so let's, let's talk about this really quickly. So, uh, you don't see agents as your your competition. You see them as your you know you, you co-opetition. You want to work together. Um, you know, uh, and I've heard this a lot, right? You, you should go out and build relationships with with those brokers or other agents to get. Um, I had Josh Flag on the show, and he said, "Man, this is something I wish I would have done earlier because you know I, I do it today, to, and, I, and to get um, you know really deep intel about about he works in Beverly Hills. Um, to, to how." Why should people do this? Build relationships with other brokers and agents, and and um, yeah, why should they do it? And how how do they go about it? Well, you know, as far as as far as my approach, yeah, your approach was that okay. My approach is number one, I make it easy for them to show the properties. I readily give them information about an area if they don't know. I answer the questions. It's not like I'm going to hold off information from them so that I'm smarter than they are. Um, when it comes into the negotiations process, um, you know, and it's, it's I don't necessarily, I don't, you know, there, there are the old school negotiators who like to really be very, um, oh, kind of in a negative approach. They're not nice about the whole thing. My feeling and my whole approach with the agent on the other side is um, one of us has the buyer, one of us has the seller. They both want, one wants to sell, one wants to buy. There's a deal to be done. Okay, so it's not playing games anymore. It's talking about negotiating and what we can to go back, you know, back and forth. So I never negotiate with a negotiative attitude. Hmm. I am always negotiating with a positive attitude, saying, you know, please, oh, you know, this is the, you know, here, here's our offer. If you have any questions, please give me a call. I never bother to tell someone, another agent. Um, what the comps are for their community. That is, to me, I, you know, I, we can discuss that personally, but if, if I get an offer on one of the areas that I'm an expertise and somebody's t- sending me who hardly ever sells in that area sends me the comps like they think they know that area, it's an offensive thing. And whether they don't, I don't think they ever do that with that intent in mind, mm-hmm. but what it does is it, it starts a negative feeling, so that person immediately is going to be confrontational with you. One of the things that I have learned is that I, you know, and I truly believe that 95% of the listing or the, the sales that fall out of escrow are because of the agents that are involved. You either are problem solving or you're, you're going back and forth blaming who did what. And I am not, I'm a problem solver. I am never a person, if there's something that's gone on, I don't care if it happened on this end or the other end. It doesn't matter. So what are we going to do to solve the problem? So I really always take them right to solution. And I think what happens over the time, people realize that I'm not going to make them feel bad. I'm not going to make them look bad. It could be a brand new agent with a brand in the very first listing. And I will always be complimentary to them. And I will treat with them with the utmost respect because I want them whenever they have a buyer to want to show one of my listings because they like working with me. Got it. Um, 
Yeah, that's um, so, you know, uh, I, I know other people go, going back to the, you know, uh, taking like a negative stance. I know other people that is their bit. If they have a listing and they're going to sit down and, and talk to a buyer, like no matter kind of what the, the offer is, they, they come at it with like, how dare you? And, and, and you know, I've, I've had some of these people on the show and like, you know, they say they'll say, man, I guarantee you I get 10 percent, 15 percent, 7 percent more than than the next guy using this approach. But they don't because typically out here what they do is they they start to lose market share. Mm. How I deal with that, because I've I've got one that I deal with all the time, I I kill that person with kindness. It's just to the point where, you know, know, it's like, you know, where you just, every time you see them, you force them to hug you. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. (laughs) And and it's amazing because what has happened over the course of the 10 years is that now that person truly understands that we are peer, yeah. we're peers, okay? And so the other day, two weeks ago, she called me up and she says, I need your help. I had nothing to do with the deal that she was talking about and what was going on, but she called me and said, I need your help. And I said, okay, I'm going to get off the phone now. I'll call you right back. Let me take care of the problem. And, had, you know, and, it, and it was just doing that for a friend in the industry, okay? It took me 10 years to get there, but this is, this is the developing a relationship where someone is willing to be vulnerable to you as another agent because we're always there. We're all, you know, we have more in common than anybody else and allowing themselves to be vulnerable enough so that you can get to the solution. Right. When the ego, you know, my feeling is that in the business is that if your ego gets so big, that you have no flex, it, it, it takes away your flexibility. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a problem, man. Especially with top producers. Ego is a big problem. <clears throat> I see it all the time. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. See, like somebody like you, you could, if we didn't get along, you could make me hug you because, you know, you're, you're sweet and you're a woman. And I would, but if it's a guy, like, I'm not going to make another guy hug me. I mean, I don't know how I, how I would <laughs> kill. And you know what I mean? Like, hey, come here, Joe. Yeah. <clears throat> hey, well, let's talk about your report. I mean, you said that your report, and I, and I, and I know it's quarterly, but. Your report is one of the most important things in terms of, uh, you know, customer, customer development and getting people really attached to your brand and you. Um, and, and, and we talked again. I don't want to talk about your report in general. I, I, what I want to talk about is the notion of, of someone in my audience saying, listen, yeah, I, want to, I want to have that, a thing like Diane, right? I want to have something that I can produce that is of real value because everybody wants to have a newsletter, but more often than not, you know, their newsletter is is junky, right? It's 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 dry stats that adds value to to nobody's day. So, I mean, what what do you think people can do to kind of have a report, create a report that is that is as valuable as yours? If they, and and again, they're not in this you know niche luxury Palm Springs market. They're you know um, they're the 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 regular old guy out in Oklahoma or, you know, upstate Poughkeepsie, New York? I still, well, it's interesting because I'm trying to teach actually the people on my team to think about what the numbers mean. Go do your homework. What's important? How are you going to attract the person to yourself? And I have found, and it's interesting, the owner of Windermere, um, you know, has always told me, he says, Diane, you think everybody thinks like you and they don't. And one of the things he has always commented is he says, you're so open to sharing your quarterly report with other agents and, you know, and whatever. And he said, why are you so open? And I said, because I said, I hope somebody gains value from it. But I do know one thing that probably 95 to 96 percent of the agents will never even take the time to do it mm-hmm. because they want this job to be a bit easier than it is. Yeah. And that's the truth, man. I mean, you can you can tell you can sit down and you know tell people what is working for you. Tell people how to go do it. And you know what? Like they're not going to do it. They're just you know agents in general. You know, I, I know a couple people, and what they'll say about real estate agents is that they're cheap, lazy, and paranoid. And I've seen all that, right? I mean, that. that, that... I, I, <laughs> yes. Yeah. <clears throat> and the interesting thing too is what surprises people is that I can be sitting home at 8 o'clock on Sunday night and get a phone call, and my client knows that I will answer the phone. Mm. 
Okay, and you know, and where there are people that you know would never consider answering a phone after you know eight o'clock. Now, granted, I can look at the number and I can see if it's not a number that I recognize. I can let it go to voicemail and I can make my decision as to whether or not I want to respond and answer. Yeah. But if it's one of my clients, my clients know I take care of them very, very well. It's like yesterday we had a horrible, horrible thunderstorm that was flooding everywhere. And the desert, it gets dry, and it's just a runoff. So there were a lot of homes damaged. I am a big, big lister, um, and I have lots of properties. Yesterday, we were checking on every one of our homes to see how they were, because most of our people are absentee during the summer and mm. you know, in the fall. We checked on all of the homes to make sure that there was no water damage. And then the first thing I do is I email my clients, one to let you know your house is okay. Right. That's good. Okay, so there's that. Yeah, and so there's that service that that takes you above and beyond. The other thing that I do, which I would say 99% of the, the agents do not, after every single showing, I immediately either email or pick up the phone and call my client and tell them the results of the showing. Um. Okay. So, so you tell them the results. I mean, but what? What? That, it's either going to be offer, no offer. Um. You know. I mean, that could be a two-minute okay. phone call, or you could. You know. Uh, you're an analytical person. If you get, if you get that engineer, like they're going to want to know. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you understand what I'm getting at? Right. Yes. So how deep? I have. I have. I don't go deep. I just didn't. You know. I let them know that we show the property. Um, that it was either the first time these people are searching and they're looking at other communities as well, mm-hmm. or they're looking at a specific floor plan. I, it's very general in nature, but what it is, it's a it's a form of communication to my client, letting them know when their home is being shown so that they know we're in and out and that we're showing the home. Most of the people never ever hear from their agent that the home was being showed or getting right. feedback. Right. What ultimately happens, and then what happens, here's the other side of the coin. It's like... Um, all um, Zillow's got this big thing going on, saying you get your client to um, to rate you on Zillow, and your your ratings where you go up on Zillow is um, you know is you, you get you get up at the top. And I tried to do that for a while, and I thought, why would I do that? That's not what I, I don't want my client to tell me, send me an email telling me how wonderful and great I am. What I want my client to tell me is, what is it that we did? Um, you know, the service that we provided. What is it that we did that you liked? What was impressive? What did you know? Give us the evaluation. Don't tell us the good. And the, you know, tell us what you really think. And it's amazing the information I get back from them is I find out the things that I'm doing, the services that I'm providing that make an impact on them, so that they can make decisions. So if the price reduction has to come down, it's not based on I'm calling them saying, okay, Mm -hmm. your home has been on the market for 30 days, so therefore, you know, what I'm doing is I'm giving them factual information. So by the time that a reduction is necessary, they see it because of the feedback I provided, not because I'm just an agent picking up the phone and calling them and telling them, okay, I've overpriced your home, so now you have to reduce it. (laughs) Right. It's it's so funny. When you were telling me that, you know, you, you give them feedback after every after every showing, I was thinking that I was like, Oh, you know what? You know, when it comes to a price reduction, I mean, you, you are placing yourself in such a great spot because you know, you're giving them live great feedback. Um, when you ask for that feedback, and I think that's something that, that, you know, I, I, that would set you apart. Just that, 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 that little tiny thing of asking your clients for feedback. How'd you do? Um, how do you go about that? I mean, uh, I don't know if there, there are things online like uh, it's called Survey Monkey, and Survey Monkey it's a yeah, free thing. Yeah, showing showing sweets winter. I I discontinued that because I find that the personal phone call or the personal email is is extremely important. So one of the things that I've started to do, and especially in my you know in my area of expertise where I do a lot, um, we ha- I you know I don't. Put, I just don't necessarily put lock boxes on every house and let the agents go freely mm-hmm. because number one you're you're dealing with people who sometimes don't know how to lock doors or yeah. you know they leave lights on or whatever right. and they don't know the community so depending on there's agents that I know that are extremely qualified and they don't need my presence to help them sell a property so for them there's access to them so that they can show the property so the ones that uh, that I don't know or I don't think know the community very well we actually I one of us will be there and we will stage the property, light it up, show it, be there to answer any questions. And by doing that, I'm seeing the buyer. I'm seeing what the buyer is saying. 
It gives me an opportunity to hear what they have to say about the home, and it also gives me an opportunity if they walk into one of my listings and say, I do not like this floor plan, I'm looking for blah, 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 blah. It gives me an opportunity if they're my client to tell them then I have other properties available for you to see, or I can tell that agent I have other properties that might better suit their needs. Right. Okay. So, so um, we can dig into that for a second. Here's what I, why I want to get at. So when you, you know, you, you're doing two things. Number one, uh, you, you give your client feedback on the showings. Number one. Okay. That's over and done. You sell the property. Mm-hmm. Then you, re- then it sounded to me like Diane, that you reach back out to them and say, tell us how we did, right? G- give us an honest mm-hmm. evaluation. What did you like? What didn't you like? How do you do that? Is it is it just a phone call and you put me on the spot? You know, you you can you can do it one of a couple ways, right? You can call me and say, "Hey, Toby, uh, we sold your home. We didn't sell your home. How do you think we did?" Right? I may not mm-hmm. give you real honest view. You know, I might go, "You did great, Diane. Let's you know, I gotta go." Um, or you can send me an email, "Hey, Toby, how do we do?" Or two, right, you can create a real survey and help people think through the process, right? Was I timely? Was I, you know, how do you go about that? I actually said it in an email. And, you know, and a lot of times with the people that um, that I'm dealing with, I don't have to give them so much. I just want to know, you know, how, you know, how are we, you know, as far as the marketing, how do we, you know, as far as our showing, our communication, um, how did the escrow process take, you know, you know, all of those things. And then they will comment back on how my team did. And my focus, you know, and this is what I keep telling my team is that I do not want them to come back and say, Diane is the best thing that ever, you know, you know, on the face of this earth. Right. earth. Right. What I want them to do is talk about the team. So what happens with my testimonials is when they come back, they talk more about what we did, not per a single person. And I love that. It's like we love the communication that came back. We love the fact that, you know, and they will pick out like Christine, who is what I would call my rock in, um, and she stays in the office, coordinates everything, and uh, the, pretty much the office manager, whatever, smart gal, she kind of holds the team together. Okay, well, they will automatically address the, the tremendous job she does. I don't have to ask for that because she's already made the impression. Mm. So it's not like I have to steer my clients to tell me what they think. They're, you know, they're open enough. And I usually do it with an email. If they don't respond and they don't give me the testimonial, I don't bother them again. That's okay. I, you know, I perfectly, you know, I'm okay with that because I also know what I've done for clients. I also am very much aware of the fact that, you know, your clients can turn on a dime. They can think you're the best thing on the face of this earth. And then within two seconds, one thing happens and they think you're the worst person yeah, I ever did. And, for sure. Okay. So, yeah. And so I, you know, I understand that that's the part of the business. So that doesn't um, upset me all that much because what I'm doing, my program and the way I run my business is very consistent. And it's very, it's been very, very, um, I, it's made me very successful. And so, but then what happens is that, okay, what I'm doing this year, what do I do? What do I need to do next year to make ourselves even better? How do I continually improve what we're doing? So I'm never static. There you go. That's, that's the analytical Diane that we know. Um, so <laughs> listen, so, I mean, let me ask you, and we're going to start wrapping up here, but so, okay. um, if you, and look, it sounds like you had a pretty good start, but you know, for you know, my audience is full of Everybody. I mean, we have people that have a team of 300, right, or brokerage of 300, all the way down to people that are just getting their license. So if you had to start over again, or, or, or what did, for somebody that is new or aspiring, what kind of advice would you give them to, to get them pushed down the road a little bit quicker? Um, number one, I would certainly make sure I would you know, get the education that you need. You know, when I when I started, I got my license. I took the immediately to the two additional classes. I immediately went for my brokers because I could, because I was a college, you know, I had a college degree, so it allowed me to go right for my brokers, which they don't do anymore. Then after that, I went for the GRI with 15 additional classes. What for me, the only way I can be good is that the more knowledge I have, the better I am. So one of the things is that when you're in the you know, when you start out, get to know as much information, research, do your homework whatever. One of the things that I find in the industry is that most of the people come into this industry and they see the people that are very, very successful. And we know that there's a small percentage of those people that are really doing the lion's share of the business. And I think that the agents that are coming in have no idea how hard they have to work in the beginning. 
have no clue. And what it is is just doing, just buckling down, going with a brokerage company that has good training, that's willing to take the time to train and has the support. There are some brokerage forms that uh, brokerage companies that just you hang your shingle and, and you're out on your own. Like, yeah. you know, you've got you got to learn the whole thing. Just because you got your license doesn't not, doesn't teach you how to negotiate doesn't teach you how to write a contract it doesn't teach you how to go into the mls and do your research and do your comps and 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 great you know and so you can great create your own credibility and i think most of the people think that you know that it's just if i just you know if somebody walks into an open house and sees me i'm going to immediately attract them and i'm going to get business it doesn't work that way yeah there's some people you know it, it it just doesn't i'm not good at open houses um i have agents who are excellent at open houses um you know it just that people are very much more outgoing and so they can gain more clientele doing open houses so it's like knowing and begin, beginning to identify what you're good at and what you're not good at, and you have to make a decision as to whether or not you're going to learn to be better at what you're not good at, or you're going to take take what you're good at it and really excel. Yeah, and okay. I that way. No, I appreciate that. And and you touched on something that that I get emails about this topic quite a bit, and uh, and I've never. I'll get to here's the thing. So I, I get uh, emails that will say, "Hey, Toby." I'm not, you know, I'm an introverted person. I'm not outgoing. And, and for the most part, the people that come on my show are very like, boom, you know, they're super successful and they're, you know, very, very outgoing. And, you know, and, and people ask me that question, how can I, as a not outgoing person, succeed in this business? And I, and, you know, I give them my thoughts on that, but, but what is your thoughts on that? Let's say that, you know, I mean, cause again, not everybody is, you know, this high D high I, uh, you know, personality. Um, what can those introverted or not outgoing people do to succeed in, in, in real estate? Well, quite frankly, I am more introverted than I am extroverted. And that's probably why if I were to go into an open house, that's probably why people don't, you know, just, you know, they don't fuzzy up to me, right? You know, because I, you know, like I can walk into a party room and I'm not one that's going to flow through the whole room and be, you know, hi, I'm, you know, right. and just go run around saying hello to everyone. That's not my nature. So what I did is I became an expert in my industry. Mm. Okay, I had to I had to find a way to communicate, reach out to them. So it's like my first six months of the business. What I did is I placed an ad in a little silly newspaper, and and then I had friends in the industry, and I asked, "Can I borrow one of your listings?" Now I wasn't one of those that borrowed twenty four different listings. I only needed one or two to get going, and it's the friends would say, "Yes, go ahead and use them." So I'd advertise one or two properties, start doing their open houses or whatever. But after six months, they were so sick and tired of seeing my face in the paper, they forgot I was new. Okay. The other part that I did was I did the the quarterly reports so that I started becoming a credibility. I started creating my credibility. And so that people then realize that here's a person who really, you know, is working hard. And then for the first two years, I busted my butt because I knew I, what I did when I came into the market. I said, I have two years to get to the top because I think this market's going to change. Mm. And at the third year, I don't want to be in the middle of the road. I've got to be at the top because when this market shifts, the only people who are going to survive are the people at the top. So by the second year in my business, I get $35 million, and out here, that's pretty darn good. And so I've continued to do very, very well throughout the industry, even in the downturn, because even during the downturn, I suit it up every single day. I suit up, I show up, and I do yeah. the same thing day in and day out. Yeah. I, I, so I didn't know that. I, that's, I, I wish I had brought that out earlier, man. We're 50 minutes into this thing, and for 48 35 million year, year two. Uh, what, so now we're at year 11. What, what kind of numbers are you doing today? Well, now because the prices have dropped, I'm doing somewhere around 40 million, but I'm doing it before because the prices were so high. Mm -hmm. I was like the second year in the business, I did something like, you know, well, I think my third year in the business, I did 48 million and 48 transactions. Now I'm doing probably 70, anywhere from 68 to 80 transactions a year. I'm doing more um, transactions. So I'm doing more and more volume, but the prices have come down. Right. Now, because the, now the million dollar market's going to start heading up, we've got properties now, a few more properties that are over a million dollars. 
Um, so we're starting to see that. So then uh, now my numbers are going to start going back up again um, to, you know, to a quite a high number just because of the fact that the market's going to start, you know, appreciating and growing. Yeah. No, and look, you're killing it. Palm Springs is a really tiny little city. Um, so, I, again, I just – so um, – I wish I, I wish we could get more out of that, right? This this whole being an introvert and how to succeed. I mean, so I mean, you had some money, you did some advertising, you know, you borrowed people's listings, and then you dug in and used your analytical mind and created this newsletter. Um, you know, if you go, you know, I know that you know you Tom Ferry was your coach. Now, I just had a, again a Tom Ferry coach on, and he said. Hey, you know, uh, you should expired should be your part of uh, one of your lead generation channels. And he and I said, okay, well, tell us how to how to do that. And he goes, this is what you do. He said, every uh, you wake up early, you look at what got expired that day, and what you do at seven four. I mean, this is incredible. He said at seven forty five, you show up on that person's doorstep. And I said, okay, you show up. I said that that's going to take some, you know, that's going to take some cojones. You show up at seven forty five, and the, and and I said, what do you say? And he said, and he walked us through the script. He said, uh, sir, I we have an emergency. You know, your house is no longer represented. I'm like, man, that is so like you're asking people to do something so unnatural, even for somebody that's extroverted, you know, um, what other things again? I mean, it's, an introvert's not going to do that. What other things right. can can someone do to, to, you know, give them just that little extra nudge in the beginning? If again, if you are an introvert. Well, I think also then, you know, it's like you can't just be all real estate. Okay, so, so, okay, so, um, like, for example, you have to become involved. You have to start doing something. One of the things that, that um, I, you know, I'm known in the golfing world. Um, I have a history in the golfing world. I've served on country club boards. I've negotiated with, buy, you know, with the developers for the members to buy the club. So it's like my portfolio is, is very deep. Okay, so I, was able, so I was known in the industry. So all I had to do is, so the people already knew what my background was and what I'd done. But at the club level, I'll, you know, instead of going and knocking on doors, one of the things that I did is I made a point of going up um, just for casual lunch during the day um, mm. at the clubhouse. Mm-hmm. Okay, and I knew all those people, and I am very, very good on that casual level. I am very good in going up and asking how someone is, I, how's everything going on, you know, how's your daughter, how, you know, whatever, carrying on that personal conversation. And they would, and, and, and what started then immediately is they would start asking me questions about what's going on with the market and yes. whatever. And then I would have an opportunity to explain, you know, express it to them. And yet never did I really carry a card with me to hand out. I would have to, if they wanted a card, I'd literally have to dig in my purse. And I said, oh, gosh, I'm really not very good at handing out cards. Here I am. And I'd dig in a purse and give them a, you know, give them a card. But what my focus was was not so much that I wasn't coming over to them to get their business. That's why it, I made it look like it was an effort for me to give them a card because it was down in my purse. Right. My, my, okay, what I wanted to come across with is I'm coming over to say hi to you because we're members of the club. And it's just that one-on-one. I had one situation that was pretty um, powerful. This person came to me. They, it, I was not involved in the transaction, but it, there was a legal um, issue going on, and they wanted to um, talk to me because I was the only person that they trusted. And, um, and so at first I said I couldn't get involved, and then after three months when things were going on, I just said, do you want to give, you, do you have all the documentation? And they said yes. And I, because they had already talked to an attorney, and they had, and I'd given them a, an attorney to call for a second opinion. And I sat down and I looked at the the paperwork, or the documentation, and what I said is clearly, it was a dual agency. And I said clearly, neither you or the buyer were protected by the agent. You had you don't, and I started running, rattling off all the forms that were missing. In, in order to actually do accomplish, and so as a result, the day before they went into the arbitration, the, their attorney called me, and I ran through all the all the paperwork documentation that should have been there. So what people know about me is that I know I know those contracts, I know what they say, I know what I'm supposed to be doing to protect my client. If I have to do a notice to perform, I do it, and you know it's not ever done in a mean way but it's to protect my client. 
Got it. And so, okay, so that's where my expertise is, is that whatever I'm doing, those people know that I'm looking out for their best interests. I love it, man. And, well, and really what I love, Diane, uh, I love the fact you said, hey, you know, if you're an introvert, get involved. Get involved doing something, right? Go join. If you can't join a club, which maybe you can't, um, mm-hmm. you know, go join a charity. There's lots of things that you, you have some kind of passion, some kind of interest. Go and do that interest. And now don't talk about real estate. And, and there you go. That, I love that. Okay. Here's our last question I ask everybody. I'm an aspiring agent. I have 25 bucks. What book should I go buy today? Interesting. Hmm. Interesting. That would be, I. Uh, you know. I should have set I, you up for I, it. I should I, have told you I was going to ask that question. Yeah. Though. Sorry. I, you know, I, I guess probably, you know, because it's for me, it's like, you know, I've read a lot of real estate books and whatever. Um, um, I think this is going to sound really, really weird, weird, but the first thing that crossed my mind is, Years ago, when I lived in Chicago, I was one of the, I, I was at the top of a, you know, I played racquetball. I competed in racquetball, and I was one of the top women racquetball players in Chicago. Hmm. And I had read The Inner Game of Tennis, hmm. and had nothing to do with racquetball, but The Inner Game of Tennis. And I went up against a gal, and as I was going on to the court, I heard a guy from my club say, I don't give her more than six points all total. And it was interesting. I heard that, and I said, hmm, I am going to fight like you've never seen before. And I walked on that court playing a gal that was ranked at the top, and I was still considered a rookie because I hadn't been playing that long, but I was still quite good at the sport. We played for two hours and 45 minutes, and we went to sudden death on the the, the end. Today, I don't remember she won or I won. I, I, I really don't. I only remember working, and we were taking breaks because we, you know, is it your turn to take a break or is it my turn to take a break? Because we kept playing, and it was the best match that I had ever played. And what it was is I went deep within me and saying, it doesn't matter what anybody out there tells me that I can or can't do. I will prove you wrong, and I will fight to the end to accomplish what I need to accomplish. And at the end of that round, I was considered one of the top racquetball players in Chicago. I had made a wonderful friend because the gal and I became quite close friends. And so to me, books like that that bring out what's, what drives you, what pulls you, what motivates you is so much more important than somebody telling you how to do something. Wow, I love it. Well, and, and for anybody that wants a copy of this, it's, it's The Inner Game of Tennis. Uh, by W. Timoth Galway. And if you want a free copy of this book, you can use our link. Just use audibletrial.com slash superagentslive and get a free copy. Hey, Diane, thanks so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. I'm sure people are going to reach out to you and say thank you. So where can people find you? Um, do you, they can always find me. Um, they can email me. Um, do, you, do you want the email? Sure, address? yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, your email or yeah. your website address, whatever. Yeah, it's, it's dianewilliamsandassociates.com, all written out, or they can always email me, dianewilliams319 at gmail.com. And I am happy to talk to any agents who need um, some, you know, for me, I'm a, I'm a big giver in helping people in the industry. That is so awesome. Hey, thanks, Diane. Thanks for coming on the show. And I, I suggest everybody, if you have a question, I mean, dude, uh, you know, Diane's willing to, to, to give you a bit of her time. So, and, you know, if nothing else, go and, and see what her, you know, sign up, get on her list and uh, see, you know, get a copy of her uh, report. I, I, I'm going to do the same. So, hey, Diane, thanks. Thanks a lot for taking the time out. Oh, thanks for inc- inviting me. I appreciate it. See ya. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to Super Agents Live. This is the one place where you can come and hear the most successful people in real estate. You'll hear how these super agents built their businesses, how they stay productive, and how they stay motivated. Who am I? My name's Toby Salgado, and I made my first million in real estate. And I'm your host for the next 30 minutes while we talk to yet another amazing real estate entrepreneur. Stay tuned. Let's go! Yeah! 